So, good afternoon, I'm Kevin Foster, I'm sure you're one. I'm responsible to start our session. Um, for those who are the first time being in Shenzhen, uh, welcome. Uh, I'm also kind of a newbie for Shenzhen. I just started knowing the city with my personal uh, experience since uh, last year because we have a very interesting program called the Fiesta. Um, I will probably go a bit more in details later. And for those who were there in Paris for the last Open Assembly, um, in, a, in the ending time, um, Stephen was asking me to um, uh, introduce the possibility to having this year the Open Assembly in Shenzhen. At that time, we were really eager to we do this, we announce like that, but we put some uncertainty. So we are really happy with all your contribution, especially you know, Stephen and uh, um, also and all, the, all the team from Sage and uh, um, he, Paris. We managed to um, organize and eventually have this open assembly in Shenzhen. Um, so this year we try to make it as, you know, a, have a new version, not only focusing on what we can do, what we should do, but also we really focus on um, who will do this and in which way we will be making it really open um, and act, kind of resonate between local and the global with all our participants from experts in different fields to um, our students in, in different countries, different universities. Now why we choose Shenzhen to organize the uh, Open Assembly Instead of, you know, even China, we have major cities like Beijing, Shanghai, probably you know even better off. Um, you will, I think from today, tomorrow, and the day after, you will easily discover that Shenzhen is a very unique city of China. Um, you know, in, in China, we have this uh, um, open society since like 37 years ago, and Shenzhen is the test tube of all the new policies to make China open to the uh, to, the, to the world and also to try the new models of economics. And now, after 37 years, it's so successful that this it's, it's, it's economy is uh, growing exponentially. But based on that, we have even more you know, diversity appeared, like uh, we have splendid uh, presenter later coming. Uh, we have the best maker space in China, uh, we, where you know, our premier went to several, uh, two years ago and said, yeah, let's, let's uh, um, simulate it and make it at the national level to make China as a maker country. And we have the founder and the um, I mean, president of the maker state, CPU, um, Eric, uh, joining us. He will share the story. I think his story is really the story about the spirit of Shenzhen. So we met him several years ago when Francois and I noticed that their story from some random news. We came to, to, to see Eric and he told us how he struggled with this. Kind of traditional thoughts, and eventually he made his uh, uh, progress, his adventure in Shenzhen. And we will have, um, you know, the top biological companies and the research institute like BGI um, here. So we have uh, Wang Wang, I think, the chief scientist from BGI. Um, BGI is another major story, especially in the bio world. I think they are so recognized; they are leading the genomic research not only in China is literally the global leader um, of uh, genomics and post genomics research. And the, the, the reason they call BGI is and the B stands for Beijing in the very beginning, but eventually they make their successful story here in Shenzhen. I think they are really um, cool of uh, um, bringing the innovator or entrepreneurship into scientific field. And we will have people like Wang Jun and uh, Li Ying Rei, those who were the hero um, in, in BGI and now they are making new adventures, they are coming to present their uh, iCarbon X story. So Shenzhen is a, such a new city where you will feel, okay, it's in big lack of all this, uh, you know, proud traditional Chinese characters that you can easily find everywhere in Beijing or Shanghai or other you know, older cities. But here you will see very new and unique values is uh, presenting, I think, the future of China. Um, and then you can easily see how to integrate the different resources and, uh, and the momentum between academia, um, with, uh, like, uh, like uh, um, industry, venture capitalists and the government working together to promote um, the frontier of innovation. So for this reason, we have all of you here um, to get this open assembly in Shenzhen and we want you to have the uh, nice trip and the exploration 
of the city. So that's why tomorrow we are going to have sessions um, in you know maker spaces in the iCarbonX uh, company and also the kind of public art for global health. Um, I think Francois, you want to probably introduce why we have originally the idea of uh, engaging young people and making interdisciplinary research and education as very fundamental. I think the key elements for what Stephen is, is describing to become a global movement. Yeah, what Stephen was, was saying is um, that we need to transform China into a big laboratory. Okay. Actually, I believe we have to transform the world into a big laboratory. Uh, and I think that's possible only because uh, if every one of us is a born scientist, and actually that's what has been shown by cognitive science like uh, Alison Gopnik in Berkeley, she showed that we are naturally born scientists. If you look at a young child, the way they watch the world, explore the world, experiment with the world, make mistakes and learn from their mistakes until they succeed, and then you know, are so proud that they are telling the world, it, you have most of the behavior that scientists have in miniature form. Okay? So I think it's, it's a very important uh, point, and indeed, uh, the youngest authors of scientific publications are eight years old. Okay. So if we are training appropriately uh, the new generation, then they can truly contribute. I mean, every one of us can, because every one of us is a born scientist, but the youngest ones are being the least constrained, so you can invite them to be uh, the most uh, open. And actually, what Alison Gopnik has shown is that if you look at different species uh, with large brains and slow maturation, in fact, in all of those species, you know, birds and primates and so on, uh, you would see that the young are the sort of R&D department of uh, the, the species because they are experimenting, innovating, making mistakes, but you know, uh, eventually finding out new things that you know, the oldest are, are not. So that's, I think, a, a very important point. And they are also, uh, on average, more concerned by the future of the world, partly because you know, they spend more time in the future than, than the others. But uh, I think you know, that, that brings us to the responsibility uh, dimension that Stephen was alluding to. And I think that one of the uh, important contributors uh, to the Paris Assembly was the Pasteur Institute. And Pasteur is you know, a top scientist, as everyone knows, but he's certainly a social entrepreneur. Okay? And what you know, we're trying to do in, in Paris is to bring social entrepreneur and sci open scientists and open education together. And that's, I think, was an important moment. And you know, just to tell a few more words about Pasteur, you know, there is uh, Jay Kumar uh, was presenting the, the notion of the Pasteur Quadrant in Paris. Okay, the Pasteur Quadrant is the idea that applied science and interesting breakthrough conceptual science are not necessarily opposite. Okay, Thomas Edison was a very good applied scientist. Schrödinger was a very good theoretical scientist. But Pasteur was both an applied scientist and a theoretical scientist. And if you're truly concerned about the world. You can you know, take some of this concern into your lab, try to solve uh, for at least a local solution, and then see if that local solution can then expand. And so Pasteur is that symbol, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why we are really happy uh, last year to, to start this in, in, in the Pasteur Institute, and I think we can uh, go uh, and bring that spirit to everyone, because you know, it used to be that to have a lab, you needed uh, some equipment that are expensive, you had to concentrate resource locally, and, and only a few people had access to it. But today, uh, thanks to this uh, sort of hardware and open hardware and, and all sorts of uh, new and elaborate versions, we can literally transform the world into a laboratory because we can build uh, the tools that we need and we can share the tools that we've built and we can share the data that we get from our tools and we can share the knowledge and the insight that we get and the innovation and, and we can bring that spirit and build together uh, this sort of world as a campus perspective where every one of us is a scientist that gather data, analyze them, share them and, and bring together uh, new insights and new innovations. That makes sense. And I think we, we do need uh, more and more of this. And you know, uh, one of the other things that is on, on that screen is the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So uh, I want to thank Arno for making that beautiful uh, drawing. Arno, stand up so that everyone can know. <laughs> okay. uh, and you can see in this beautiful drawing, uh, first the world. Uh, I mean, maybe you should tell us what's on that drawing. So, uh, working with the crew, Francois and Gail over here, on uh, looking at sustainable development goals. And so it seemed like it was a perfect opportunity to be able to uh, consolidate some of the ideas, uh, the theme of the conference, 
uh, with these goals. And so, uh, not uh, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the theme of the assembly was first announced, I didn't know quite what to make of it myself, except in my own small world, I was working on mobile health applications at Sage. And so for us, it was very obvious that when you're monitoring symptom severity and disease for a single individual, and you amass that across tens of thousands or millions of people, you have an opportunity to be able to make a vast change, a worldwide change. So everybody contributing data and aggregating that data, and for scientists and individuals around the world having access to those data, we can actually make a change that, that could be quite grand. So in this poster, what I was trying to convey was the paragon of human measurement, or personal measurement, is, of course, da Vinci's uh, uh, Vitruvian man. So he's at the center, and the world is around him. And what I did there was play with something that might not be obvious or easy to see on the screen, but it's a more infringed pattern. So it has two uh, set of concentric circles, one from the brain and one from uh, the center of the human, and they intersect, creating a different pattern. And this is supposed to evoke the notion of uh, sensors and a world that's being sensed. It's surrounded by the 17 colors uh, with characters that are emblematic of the 17 goals, the 17 sustainable development goals by the United Nations set in 2015. And Liu Ping was uh, kind enough to offer uh, uh, single characters that were intended to... Yeah, impossible. But these individual characters were supposed to convey each of these sustainable development goals and uh, a larger description uh, for those who read Chinese are color coordinated around the, the border. That's all. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Arno, for doing it and explaining this beautiful request. So clearly, you know, the United Nations has defined these 17 goals. So for those of you that don't read Chinese, okay, there, there is uh, English versions of, of those different goals oh, and actually in all of the languages. The Chinese doesn't help a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, you know, they cover every field where the world has a problem, okay? From climate to biodiversity to poverty to health to education to gender issues and, and, and so on and so forth. Okay? So every one of those issues is there. Okay? And they are all, if we want to have a sustainable future, we need to solve those problems collectively. Okay? If not, we will fail collectively and that will, you know, uh, there is no uh, you know, second planet or at least not yet. Uh, so we really have to, to fix that planet even if we want to go to another one. Uh, so I think we have to, to start thinking about those issues. And interestingly, there's people that are trying to educate the next generation in thinking about those issues. Okay, there's something called the World Largest Lesson that is available in all languages that explain those uh, 17 uh, challenges for, for kids. Okay? What we want to do is bring this one step further and invite every university student that care about, such, about the future of the planet to understand the issues that are quite complex, realize that you know, there is no easy fix, but there is some beginning of solutions that have been tried here and there that maybe they can learn about and try to see if they can implement them where they are. Okay? And we would like students to be able to receive uh, acknowledgement for their will to engage with society. And so instead of you know, getting classical curriculum where they have to learn about things of the past, we want to uh, invite them to engage uh, for this global issue, learn about the issues, uh, and try to share their insight uh, on the largest possible scale. So maybe, looking you want to talk about the summer school here? Yeah, so basically we have um, kind of planning, and I think Stephen will stress on that later, but I think um, the, the, the spirit of the Open Assembly is not to have just a single activity for uh, two or three days. It's like to have a continuum and also the um, uh, cooperation among us and also between us and the students to think and to work on the challenges uh, like uh, for healthcare but also for the other 16 um, you know, challenges in the global goals. So um, as one of the uh, continuous activity or effort we're trying to make is in the summer, we are trying to organize distributed summer activity. Shenzhen is one of the spots, Paris is another, and probably we'll have people working in you know, Harvard and as in Polo to have different summer uh, summer camps and summer schools so that our students can pick some of the uh, 17 challenges to work on. So here in Shenzhen, we are trying to make uh, integration between teacher leadership training, where helping more teachers to help younger people to deliver their um, innovation capability. And also with uh, University of Geneva and several others like Sciences Po, 
Um, in Harvard University, we are trying to coordinate on um, called the C40 uh, summer year. The students will focus more on environmental challenges and use their interdisciplinary capability to, to propose <coughs> ideas. And also, Francois and Steve, I think they are really uh, eager to promote on uh, the digital technologies, including uh, you know, um, mobile app, where we can engage as many as possible people from you know, kindergarten age to as old as you can imagine, um, people to uh, to the um, interaction and uh, making uh, work for environmental protection and so on. And this is one of the things. And the summer activity will be, I think, um, open for uh, application and uh, for both organization and also um, joining us in, in Shenzhen or in Paris and other cities. Besides that, I think a more continuous effort, as you know, Sita was mentioned about the responsibility, in the morning, when our journalists are asking, okay, how do we encourage people to be both disciplinary but also be consensitive to this challenge, and Sita was answering, is we need to start as early as possible. So what we try to do is to build an educational program on this Shenzhen uh, campus of Shenzhen University, where uh, we are going to have, uh, we have the CEO of our carbon tax, and he's going to tell you the adventure. Um, so basically, we want to make the master programs first in Shenzhen. Um, one is more for bio nano information technology as a training <coughs> program where our students will be taking care of challenges in healthcare. And another is more related to internet, internet plus innovation and design, where we can find more broad ideas, more creativity to tackle all these listed challenges. And there is, you know, we are starting from master program, but as in key, it, you know, we can, we can move down to bachelor and the younger to higher and middle school, just when I'm presenting like a message from a local high school asking, can we live together to move on um, on these ideas to engage our students to a uh, bigger activity. So I think the beauty here is we have a planted root in Shenzhen, making use of all our educational resources, academic resources, industry resources, and uh, you know money from the uh, venture capitalism to um, try to find out both local but also global uh, resources and solutions for for, for those all these uh, uh, challenging uh, problems. And uh, based on what happened in, in Paris and Shenzhen and uh, you know. Seattle and other uh, cities around, I think we should think of making a global kind of network where all the resources, information, and progresses can be well um, um, you know, um, shared and integrated in a positive way where we don't need to reinvent all the wheels uh, again and again. So in, in integrate the contribution from younger kids and all the different fields um, in Shenzhen is one of the major efforts we want to you know, uh, to contribute to the global challenge. But I think it's the global uh, engagement and all the complementary resources in different um, city and country around the world is the uh, major key to have a coherent uh, planet. So clearly, you know, the, the complexity of the issues that are there and the massive scale makes it that it's impossible for any single person to go there. But it's even true that no single discipline can solve uh, even one of those complex challenges, even less, you know, the 17. So clearly, we have to uh, bring as much collective intelligence uh, as possible, as much collective agencies, okay? And sometimes I like to talk about, you know, open CIA to, to summarize this, okay? So you win, I mean, open collective intelligence and open collective agencies. <laughs> okay. So C is for collective, I is for intelligence, and A is for agency. Okay, but it's you know the, the, the meaning of intelligence and agency is different in the classical CIA and the open version of CIA. Okay? We want uh, an intelligence that is serving the world and not you know surveying us, uh, and we want an agency that is not controlling us, but is every one of us is becoming an agent of change and an agent uh, that contributes positively to the world. Okay? So that's what we're trying to uh, build in this uh, open CIA uh, perspective. And, and, and this not I self and not I world, you know, if you were to know what the CIA, NSA, and you know, Google and, and so on know about you, what would you do? Okay? And if you could know it's about the collective of people around you, what that would help you to do? Okay? That's the sort of question we're trying to ask when we talk about this open CIA perspective. 
And so I think we need ever more sources of intelligence. And so we can tap into the diversity of intelligence that we have among humans. We can look at all sorts of biological forms of intelligence. And we can also start building on new forms of intelligence, like artificial intelligence, that we are building. Okay? And some people are afraid about these new forms of intelligence because they might take away jobs, they might you know, uh, create all sorts of uh, uh, nightmare uh, scenario uh, of science fiction. But I believe that given the amount of problems we have in the world, we need more intelligence and not less. Okay? Uh, but we have to be able to foster a sort of co-evolution between uh, the form of intelligence that we're familiar with, with these new forms of intelligence. Okay? And so, I mean, you probably all heard about Go. Okay? Is there anyone that didn't hear about AlphaGo? Okay. So, uh, and you know that the very same thing happened to chess 20 years ago. Okay? Uh, and so we have more time to reflect on the chess, and we can maybe go to the Go uh, a little later. But in chess, when the world champion Gary Kasparov lost against Deep Blue, he organized what he called advanced chess, or what's now called center chess. Okay? So center, as you remember, is this mythical uh, hybrid between the horse and the human. Okay? And the central chess is the hybrid between the human brain and the uh, artificial intelligence. Okay? And what's interesting is that the best games of chess that are being played these days is not the machine alone, it's not the man alone, it's the man and machine coming together. Of course. Of course. Uh, and so we need to bring, I think that's a, a sort of a symbol for the future of intelligence, is the combination of man and machine coming together and using their collective to be able to solve some of the hardest challenges that we have, such as those 17 uh, United Nations uh, challenges. So I think we need to bring more of this, and, and it's not only individual human and individual machine, but it's the collective of humans and the collective of machines. Okay? Again, in chess, uh, the first competition that Kasparov organized was won by men and machine beating machines alone, beating men alone. Uh, but it's not the best man with the best machine that won. It's, it was two men working with five machines. Okay? Uh, and, and they were not very good chess players. They were sort of the level that I could beat, okay? if taken one on one. But they were uh, very good at knowing which machine to trust at which moment and making the best possible decision. Whereas the grandmaster that was playing with a big machine didn't know when to trust the machine and when to trust himself. Okay? Uh, and so I think we, we need to be working on this sort of paradigm. Okay? Uh, and I think we need to be uh, co-evolving the intelligence of the machine that are just picking up. If you look at Go, for instance, uh, what's interesting is that you might have heard that a European champion got defeated a few months ago. Okay? And he was, you know, because Europe is not a very strong in Go, he was ranked number 600 in the world. Okay? After six months of playing with the machine, he's not number 300. Okay? So he progressed, and the machine progressed to be the world champion okay, in these six months. But clearly they've co-evolved. Uh, and the machine learned from the human, and the human learned from the machine. Okay? And clearly, I think the next generation is going to push those limits ever further in ways that are hard to anticipate, but hopefully will contribute to some of this. So we have to be able to uh, design new ways of pushing knowledge forward where we bring the intelligence of man and machine uh, together to solve those hard problems and in the same time mobilize the collective intelligence of the next generation. Okay? So I think the next generation, instead of being trained to know the knowledge of the past, which is, I don't know in your countries, but in every country I know that's the way it happens, uh, you have to invite them to start thinking about the future, because knowledge of the past is in the machine anyway. So if the only thing you know is knowledge of the past, then the machine is going to take over the job that you might have. So you have to be able to not compete for yesterday knowledge, but to build tomorrow's solution, collectively, cooperatively, using the best that man and machine can bring. Okay. And I think we have to train that next generation in doing these things, and the best way to do it is to make them understand the big challenges and invite them to start thinking creatively about new solutions and to cooperate uh, between the different uh, levels that can bring together different types of solutions. So uh, we can discuss more of this uh, later if you're interested, but in, in Paris we have had started programs training first university students uh, to do these things, and progressively we started with children from primary school and secondary school uh, where we invite them to think about global challenges on one side, and on the other side, we invite them to think about research method, and we uh, have this kid scientist uh, program where we invite the children 
to start from their own questions. You probably know that children are asking many questions, uh, but the peak of questions is four years old. Okay? As soon as they start entering into the education system, for some reason, they have less and less questions. Okay? And actually, you know, my own son, when he was six, he arrived in school and his teacher told me, he's such an ass kid, but he's asking questions. Okay? Uh, and I told her it's a genetic disease we have in the family and so on, but, you know, so, you know, she, but I mean, we have this problem. Okay? We are killing kids' curiosity and creativity. And so we have, instead of killing it, we have to foster it, nurture it, and, and, and develop it further so that they can start contributing uh, to these huge challenges. Thank you.